Hi, my name is Scott and I'm a member with Restored Church. If you're new, we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in. We believe the church is not an event, but a family you belong to. So we would love the opportunity to connect with you. If you want to learn more about our church or if we can help you in any way, please visit our website www.RestoredTemecula.Church and click on contact. We also have a mobile app with resources including our Sunday messages, information about upcoming events, and other ways to connect. You can download our app on the Apple or Android app stores. With all that said, we hope you enjoy the message. I love you guys. Here we go. All right, guys, good morning. My name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at Restored Temecula along with Tom. And I want to welcome you to our Sunday morning gathering. Uh, we're in a series that we are calling Priesthood. And if you're new, Tom, Tom already mentioned this during family time, but we're going to keep reiterating, reiterating this quite a bit. Is that This is a season in, in our in the life of our church where we believe that we're being called to restore our identity as priests. And as Tom mentioned, priests are people who bring sacrifices to God, people who minister to God, people who are devoted to him. Uh, priests are people who, I'm going to get into more of actually who they are and what they do in this message. I'm not going to give it all away. But pre- being a priest is a huge deal. And we have a launching off point for this series, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I'm going to go ahead and read those. That's not where, we're gonna, where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time this morning. But I do want to start there because I think it, it helps set the foundation for where we're going uh, as a church community. Before I do, would you pray with me uh, for this time? Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you that you love us deeply and that we get to live life in response to your love, that we get to learn what it means to be your people in this world, priests whose life is oriented around you, blessing you, ministering to you, being set free to live life fully and freely with you at the center. Thank you for that. And I pray that you would do something. That this morning would be a part of restoring our priestly identity to us as a community. Would you have your way? God, we thank you and we love you. In your name I pray, amen. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. It should be up on the screen. And go ahead and, uh, and read. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander, like newborn infants desire the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation, if you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by people, this is Jesus, rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house. Hold on to that for a little bit later, okay? We're a spiritual house. We're being built to be a holy priesthood. There's the word. Holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, Jesus. The one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe. But for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this has become a cornerstone and a stone to stumble over, and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. But you are a chosen race, or in other translations, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Beautiful. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people, You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Awesome. Okay. So today we're going to be in Exodus 25, and we're going to pick up on this idea of mercy. It's the last word in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 10. And so we've not been in Exodus, and, uh, and what we're going to read today might seem fairly obscure. It's not the most obscure thing in the Old Testament. There's way more obscure stuff. But it might feel a little bit obscure to you. So I thought it'd be helpful for me to share a little bit of the backstory of how I wound up in Exodus 25 for this message. So, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago, uh, I was at the office, myself and Mark and Tom, and uh, we got together and we've been doing this 
uh, every Monday morning where we get together at 1030 for a time of just praise, ministering to God with our, with our voices, with our song. And uh, this is one of those mornings where uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been, if you've been there, uh, where you're kind of like, ah, I don't know that I really want to do this right now. Uh, where it's sort of like the last thing you want to do is really praise. Uh, it felt like, it felt forced to me. And, uh, and here's a pastor saying praise felt forced. So this is real. I, I, I don't think I stand to gain anything from this. It doesn't paint, paint me in the best light. But I just didn't feel like it. I just wasn't into it. And there's a very simple reason why. Because I had a lot on my mind. Uh, there was other things that felt, dare I say, more important, uh, more urgent than praising God. And so I was just in a bad mood. I was grumpy, and, uh, and I just, I, I didn't have a choice. Like, they were there. We had to do this. So, so we did it. Um, and so today's message was born out of a miserable Monday morning. Okay? But here's the cool part. Like, it didn't stay that way. And the text that I'm about to read is a huge reason why. So we're going to be in Exodus 25. Now, I need to give you a little bit of context, because we haven't been in Exodus Ever? A couple times. Long time. So in the, in the story of the Exodus, uh, if, if you don't know the story, God, Yahweh, is the God of Israel, and the, God of, the people of Israel were in Egypt, and God heard their cries. Egypt was this beautiful place, but they became like a prison for them, because they were under the oppression of Pharaoh, and they cried out to God for a long time, and God heard their cry for help. And he rescued his people in a remarkable, dramatic fashion. It's worth a read. Check it out in Exodus if you have time this week. Now, the people are in the wilderness. So they're no longer in Egypt. They're now out. They have been been sent out by Pharaoh uh, rather forcefully. And uh, now they're in the wilderness. And unfortunately, even though this has been like this wonderful, dramatic rescue, things are not going well. Uh, The people were hungry, and they were thirsty, as tends to happen in the wilderness, and they start complaining, and they start grumbling against God and against Moses, uh, their leader, who had led them out of Egypt. So in their lack, they started to long for Egypt, is what was going on. So they're crying for compassion one day, and then the next day they're complaining about circumstances. Bit of a problem. Why? Because it causes them to be unfaithful to their God and to turn to other gods to save them. Here's the cool, not the cool part. The crazy part about this is that just like Adam, Adam is representative of humanity. I think Israel is also representative of humanity because if we're honest with ourselves and I'm honest with myself right now, this is us. This is us. Crying out for compassion one minute and then complaining about circumstances the next, right? They are us. We are them. So this should feel somewhat familiar, familiar ground if if you've been following God for any amount of time. And if you're here and you're new and this is all new to you, I'm so glad you're here. This is a cool story, I think, that will help uh, illuminate that God has a plan despite the human brokenness that exists in our world. So let's read Exodus 25, verse 8, just one verse that I think is really important. It says this. This is the, this is the Lord God, Yahweh, talking to his people. And he says, they are to make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them a sanctuary for me so that I might dwell among them. Make me a house. I want to move into the neighborhood with you, is the heart of God towards his unfaithful people. Think about the, like someone that annoys you. They complain a lot. They grumble. Um, typically, you're like, I'd like to get away from that person or that situation. It's natural, right, to, to want to distance yourself from annoying people. God's like, I want to move next to you. Does this surprise anybody? God's moving into the neighborhood. There's a problem, though. People can't seem to stop sinning against him. And sin, what if part of what the Old Testament really helps us to see is that sin has a contaminating impact. It pollutes our hearts. It alienates us from God and each other. And it causes us to wonder, wander. So Israel needs God's presence and his purification. They need to be cleansed. And in these verses that we're going to read right now, We read God's plan just for that. So turn over with me. Here's our main text for the morning. Exodus 25, verses 17 to 22. Exodus 25, verses 17 to 22. Here they are. This is the Lord God speaking. He said, make a mercy seat of pure gold. And actually, before we get into this, to to let you know, this is what's going to go 
in the holy of holies, which is like the hot spot. This is, this is the master bedroom of the house, if you will, or the, the throne room, better way to put it, actually. The throne room of God. And this is what he wants right in the center. Verse 17, make a mercy seat of pure gold. In some translations, you're going to see that called an atonement cover. So I'll explain that later. Mercy seat, atonement cover of pure gold, 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. Make two cherubim of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other at the other end. And at the two ends, make the cherub of one piece with the mercy seat. The cherub are to have wings spread out above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they're to face each other. The faces of the cherubim should be toward the mercy seat. Set the mercy seat on top of the ark and put the tablets of the testimony that I will give you into the ark. So the, the, in the center of this is like the, the law of God, okay? The, the Ten Commandments, if you will, they're going to be like right there. And over on top of this is this mercy seat and these cherubim. I will meet with you there. This is the key verse in this whole thing, verse 22. I will meet with you there, above the mercy seat, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony. I will speak with you from there about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. Okay. I'm sitting in the office that Monday morning, miserable, and it starts to dawn on me. Worship is about God. But in this moment, it's about me. I'm at the center. And so Tom and Mark are singing, and I'm sitting there, sort of singing, not really singing. But as they're singing, I'm drawn back to what I read earlier that morning, which was verse 22. I had read this during, during my time in the scriptures that morning. I will meet with you there above the mercy seat. Okay. Quote number one, if you guys have it in the back. The mercy seat, what is this? It represented God's, Yahweh's throne on earth, and his presence resided there. So this is a huge part of knowing who God is, is understanding what this mercy seat, this is where you're going to find him. This is the hot spot of God in the earth. And so the mercy seat, also translated atonement cover, is where these priestly sacrifices would happen. The priests would go in, and they would sacrifice to the Lord. What happened with those sacrifices? What happened when blood was brought in to that space? Quote number three. It's a little bit of a longer one, but I think it's, it's important. It's valuable. Quote number three. I think we, we might have it. There it is. So there's this problem that I talked about earlier. How could God receive an unholy people into his holy presence? So how did God resolve the problem? Here's a quote that helps explain this. The word cover, again, mercy seat, atonement cover. We're talking about the same thing. So the word cover is the literal meaning of the Hebrew words kipper or kofer and was later translated into Old Testament, into Old English as atonement. Atonement, I don't know, when I hear that word, I don't know what that means necessarily. It's not a word that gets used a lot. Um, so Old English, atonement, but here's what it means. The Israelites, the people of God, saw the blood of an animal as a symbol of the animal's life itself. The life is in the blood. So at least you can see Leviticus 17, 11. Since blood represents life, or the opposite of death, sprinkling it around the temple would act like a detergent. It symbolically washed the temple of death and defilement, the natural result of sin. So the end result is that God's presence stays with the people of Israel. That's what has to happen in order for God's presence to stay with the people of Israel. You need blood. You need life. Life needs to, be, needs to be sacrificed in order for that to happen. I will meet you there above the mercy seat. Now, this is the tabernacle, but it's the same idea. And the tabernacle is in the temple. I will meet you there above the mercy seat. It dawned on me. He meets me in my mess. He meets me in my mess which is true for you too. Like he meets you in your mess. And that changed my morning. It made it a little easier to sing. So I was like, oh, I'm being ridiculous right now. But this is also something that's changed my life. 
This isn't just about a Monday morning at the office, although it's not, not about that. But this has actually changed my life. Uh, growing up, I had a pretty stable upbringing. I lived in a nice area, Orange County, nice and successful. And we had what we needed. That was a joke. Nobody... It's cool. Uh, it's a nice area, South Orange County. We had what we needed as a family. It wasn't perfect, but it, I had a stable upbringing. And yet, I found myself at 23 years old, lost. In life, everything I looked to, relationships, romance, career, status, all failed to deliver. The weight of my existence could not bear it. My life was actually marked by fear and insecurity. I've had lots of time to think about this, so fear and insecurity, and I would alternate between pride and despair. Those are actually closely linked. You can go back and forth between those, and I did. I was grasping for control or comfort all the time. And it all, basically, the, the end result for that in my life was that it crowded out Jesus. Like, I knew at the time that he was calling me, but I didn't want him. Until one day, I had an encounter with him, specifically, his mercy. His mercy. Like, I actually knew that I was a sinner for the first time. And I actually knew that my sin and my rebellion sent him to the cross. But that wasn't enough. I actually had to experience something more, something deeper. And for the first time in my life, 2008, I knew that he went to the cross willingly for me. Like he loved me and he gave up his life for me. And he did the very thing that I had been so unwilling to do for him. That changed my life. And I hit the streets of San Diego. I lived on Friars Road. If you've ever been down there before, there's a, there's a um, I was going to say a restaurant. It's a mall called Fashion Valley. Anybody been there? Yep. Okay, so I used to live right across the street, catty corner from Fashion Valley, and when I had this encounter with Jesus, I hit the streets. Uh, I became so aware of his presence, it was like he moved into my apartment down there on Friars, and he led me to go into the streets. He sent this wandering soul who he had given a home to those wandering the streets to invite them into his home. It was a delightful time in my life. It really was. Some of the best days of my life were those, those early days of following Jesus. It was about him. I used to sit in my, in my bedroom, and I used to just cry and sing. I would read the scriptures and be like, this is the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. He's real. Uh, but then something changed. You want to hold that for a second? Something changed. <laughs> Not all at once, but gradually. I went from being someone who could cry in the presence of God, thinking about his majesty and the wonder and the beauty of God, to, okay, now I have to put myself together and get on the business of being a good Christian. I need to do all the things. And so I started focusing on everything that I have to do for God. And I had started to forget everything that he did for me. Just forget it. Like the people of Israel. And when I lost touch with the mercies of God, I just started to manage my life. I just started managing my life. And then this gap formed. So there was the mercy of God over here, where my eyes were once fixed, leading to devotion and praise. And then over here, on the, on the other side, managing my life, where my eyes were now fixed. Those are the two sides. And now there was a separation, a chasm in between the two. And what filled that chasm was misery, religious misery. That same pride and despair, the same fear and insecurity, grasping for control or comfort that was there before came back. Only a religious flavor of it. And a critical one, too. Critical of myself, critical of other people. And here I am. I'm a mess again. I've been saved, and now I'm a hot mess, and I just I feel it. I know it. And so what did I do? I started to manage the mess by doing more, by just trying harder, tightening up standards, but what ended up happening was, like, I, spiritually speaking, I just started spinning my wheels. I didn't move forward. I was stuck. From Mercy to Management, my memoir <laughs> that no one wants to read, including me. It's lame. <clears throat> With that said, uh, something happened. Something changed. One day, I was sitting there. I was working downtown, in downtown San Diego at a law firm, and uh, a coworker of mine approached me, and he... he was, he found out I was a Christian, and he wanted to, he had like a, he wanted to sit down and talk about scripture with me, and I was like, sure, 
I want, you, I want to show how much Bible I know. That's what I thought. And so we start reading scripture and we start meeting over lunch and he begins to teach me about the grace of God. And I begin to get reacquainted with the mercy of God for me, just from the Bible. I started to learn the Bible is about mercy. And it started to tenderize my heart once again. And looking back on it all these years later, I realized that God sent my friend on a mission of mercy to meet me in my mess. This one-time missionary became the mission field. And I received his love for me. Thirteen years later, I have not stopped needing mercy. I haven't. When I was lost, he met me in my mess. And he still meets me in my mess. And when I stop trying to manage my life without him, I get him. I get him. I get his presence and his purification. It's like I, get, I realize, like, oh, he's been here all along. He moved in. I just haven't been a great roommate or spouse or whatever analogy you want to use. It gets weird for the guy, whatever. <laughs> he met me in my mess, and I just want to tell you this morning, like, he wants to meet you in your mess. I just want you to think about your life. Like, are you managing your life right now? Is that... And by the way, I'm not saying that like managing our life is bad. I'm talking about like managing your life without God, without an awareness or a knowledge of God, kind of on your own. Yeah. Are you managing your life or your mess without mercy, without his presence and purification? Is that true for you today? I remember once... Uh, sitting in a gospel community meeting, if you're new, our gospel communities are groups of men and women and, and youth who are learning to follow Jesus together. And I remember once I was in a gospel community down in San Diego. This was probably, gosh, like eight years ago, quite a while ago. And we were, we were doing, story, we were sharing our stories. Gospel communities share their stories with one another over time. As there's trust that's built up, people begin to share, here's who I am, here's what I've been through, and all that stuff. And at that time, we were learning a, a way to share our stories more evangelistically. In other words, like I could share my story and tell someone about how I met Jesus. So we had this tool for doing that, and it kind of followed this, this trajectory of like creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. The story of the Bible is way more complex than that, but that's just a simple tool that helps people tell their stories. So one of the guys in our gospel community tells his story, and, and everybody had been kind of saying, like, creation, here's, what, here's my life, and here's where it started, here's where things broke in my life, here's how I met Jesus, and here's where I'm going, how he's changing me. Does that make sense, that progression? Okay. So he tells the story, and he gets done, and I was like, oh, something's missing <laughs> And, uh, and so I just kind of started asking him questions, and um, I realized, like, oh, there's no fall in this story, like, no, no sin. And so I asked him about that, and he's like, well, maybe I'm pre-fall. <laughs> They're completely serious. And if you don't know, if you're like, what is the fall? The fall, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to that moment in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve the, the, the humans who were representing us in the, in the garden with God rebelled against him, chose to sin and not listen to God's words, and then were ultimately exiled out of God's presence. There was a fall. We were created to know God and love him and be with him, and there was this fall moment that alienated us from God. So what this man was telling me was like, I haven't experienced that. Maybe I haven't fallen yet. And it's something that stuck with me. Uh, for a long time, a, a long, long time. That was years ago. And I think about it fairly regularly because it was essentially saying, like, I don't believe the Bible, um, which is what he was saying. But I actually don't think he was pre-fall because you can't be pre-fall. <laughs> the fall has affected us all. You could, be very, you could have very low awareness of how fallen you are, which I think is what he demonstrated in spades that day. But um, which, Whatever. We were there to help. We're there to help. It's just a reality. He didn't, he didn't know. He didn't know the Bible story. Uh, but he wasn't actually pre-fall. He was actually pre-mercy. 
He was pre-mercy. And a, a human created in the image of God, part of being created in his image is that we're priests, that we're, we're here on this earth to reorient our life to devoting to, to praise and devotion to God. That's part of what it means to be human. But he was pre-mercy because he didn't see the mess. He didn't see it. So how could God meet him in his mess if he wasn't messy? Does this make sense? So it's possible to be in the church and be pre-mercy. It's possible to be in the church for years and be pre-mercy. You don't see the mess, or what's probably more likely is that you just manage the mess on your own, or I manage the mess on my own. We've never gotten to the point where we actually asked Jesus for mercy. Okay, so that's one thing. It's possible to be pre-mercy. I'm giving you guys options. You can chew on this. Also, I don't usually print my stuff out, and I'm seeing why. <laughs> but pre-mercy is not the only category. There's also moving past mercy. There's also moving past mercy, which is a big deal if you've been in the church for a long time. So this would be managing life without God. How do you know? You're miserable. You have a high awareness of what you need to do for God, but little to no daily awareness of what he's done for you or is doing. And very little of this praise. But a lot of complaining and criticism. If you're in that spot, you might have actually blown past mercy. Like I did. I shared my story already with you. Pre-mercy or past mercy? There's another option, though, too. It's praise in light of his mercies. Pre-mercy, past mercy, or praise in light of his mercies. That's you. If you're in a spot right now where you're like, I am praising, praise him. There are things that are going to come after that. There's... Satan's going to hate that, the enemy, the one who deceived Adam and Eve, is going to hate that and going to try to take you down. But if you're in a spot where you are praising God for his mercies, you are a priest. And you are experiencing your priesthood, and it is good. And I think that for most of us, we're probably in a pre- or post-mercy space. But this whole series is about reclaiming our identity as priests. It's moving into a space of praising God for his mercies. Now, wherever you're at, whether you're pre-mercy, you're praising, or you're post-mercy, I want to remind you that you are in the presence of mercy here. He's here. Jesus, our faithful high priest who sacrificed himself. Hebrews 10, verses 21 to 23. The high priest would go in and he would cleanse and purify the space so that God could dwell with his people. But that he had to do every single year in Israel. Why? Because there was still a problem. There was still a problem. The high priest was not able to actually ultimately do the cleansing of the heart that was required for us to be reunited to God and have access to his presence. So Hebrews 10, I think we might have those verses. Hebrews 10, verses 21 to 23 are about Jesus, our true high priest. Since we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Yep, Wayne Grudem. Actually, can you go back to that, that quote? The answer to our search for ultimate meaning lies in declaring the excellencies of God. That's what Peter said earlier. For he alone is infinitely worthy of glory. Redemption is ultimately not man-centered, but God-centered. When we have such a high priest over the house of God who has washed us and cleansed us, who's shown us mercy, you know what comes out of our mouth? Melodies. Of mercy. So melodies. If you receive mercy, melodies will go out of your mouth. 
Can we put the first Peter uh, verse, verses back up, the, the, the end of the chapter, where he talks about proclaiming the excellencies of him? I'm going to go back to this really quickly. I want to show you guys something. I think it might be verse 8, second, sec, first Peter chapter 2. There we go. Thank you. This would be verse number 9. Verse number 9. We are a royal priesthood. Why? So that we can praise. Proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What's my point in saying this? Uh, you, can't, you can't actually proclaim the praise of God if you're in darkness. You can't praise if you're in darkness. But if you've received mercy, you're in the light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In other words, if you have received mercy, melodies will just come out your mouth. That's the truth. So I'm going to invite you guys to stand. I'm going to call the band up. You can't minister to God without receiving mercy. So where are you at today? Pre-mercy, praising, or post-mercy, or past mercy? I just want you to know like the, the mercies of God are for you. The mercies of God are for you. And he can meet you in your mess and liberate this tongue from apathy or from whatever might be holding it. Because if we think about it, is there anything better than knowing Jesus? Is there anything better than knowing Jesus? Money, status, power, prestige. People who have had that, guess where they wind up? Dead. Let's pray. But people who have an encounter with God's mercy end up raised. You pick what you want. Father, thank you. I thank you for your mercies shown in the, on the cross of Christ who went to the cross for us, for me, for every person in this room, every person hearing my voice, he went to the cross willingly and laid down his life so that we might live. He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We get to proclaim the mercies, the praises of him. Is there anything better? I pray that you'd give us a vision, an understanding, an awareness of how good he is so that we might actually want to praise him. So that melodies would come out of our mouths not just here on Sundays, though certainly here on Sundays, but during the week, when we rise in the morning, when we're doing dishes, when we're at our office, when we're hanging with our kids, when we're going to sleep, melodies coming out of our mouth, praising the excellencies of Jesus. May that be true. May that be so. And may you pour out your spirit and awaken us to this beautiful reality. We thank you in your name. Amen. I'm going to hand it over to Tom. Uh, before I call the prayer team forward, um, man, so strong, JB. Meet me at the mercy seat. Some of you, I'm convinced, you've been like, you've been in, you're in a season right now where you're like, God, where are you? I don't feel you. I don't sense you. I don't know where you are. I'm, I've been asking you to intervene in these spots in my life, and I just don't feel you. I don't sense you. Where are you? You know what he says? Meet me at the mercy seat. When you're ready, I'll be there. That's what we're gonna do right now. This is about meeting him in his mercy, that he loves you, 
regardless of what today's looked like, regardless of what this week has looked like, regardless of what your entire past has looked like. He says, meet me at the mercy seat. And so for the rest of our time gathering, how much time do we have? We have like 20, 20, 25 minutes before we're gonna close. This is time and sp- consecrated time. Do you know what that means? It means it's set apart specifically to minister to him. And here's the thing, as you do that, as you meet him in that space, what happens is he actually ministers to you. He actually pours his love into your soul out of mercy. So Ben, will you guys serve us? This is, fill the room with praise. Minister to your God. And then in just a moment, um, uh, if the prayer, actually, you know what? If the prayer team, would you guys mind making your way to the side of the room? There's trusted men and women off to the side that are here to, to minister to you if you need it, okay? Maybe you're, uh, I do feel like there's people in the room where you're experiencing kind of inflammation in your body right now. Go receive prayer. I think God wants to, wants to intervene there. Um, maybe there's other things going on. Maybe there's fear and there's worries and there's anxieties happening inside of you. God wants to minister to you through his people. So we're gonna fill this whole space with praise, with ministry to bless him. Why? Because he's worthy. Why? Because he pours his mercy out on us over and over and over again. Let's meet him at the mercy seat, huh? Okay, enjoy him.
meet you in your mess. I bow before, I bow before, I bow before the Lord of Lords. I bow before, I bow before, I bow before. Rain. 
you're, if you're on the prayer team, will you guys come and meet up here? That way people can see. I think there's a lot of people being prayed for. That's wonderful. Just come up and then you guys can pray for people here. We're going to keep praising him. Um, but I want to make sure that everyone can receive prayer that wants to, okay? Yeah. Lead us. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you
there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me I pray that our, our lives would be marked in such a way where when, you, when we observe each other, when we observe us as a collective of, of, of a family, a worshiping family of priests, that would be marked by just this, this dedication to proclaiming your worth. You're worthy. And what's absolutely bonkers is that you say that back to us. The cross of Christ says, you're worth it to me. Let us never depart from that. Your mercy on display in the coming of Christ, the perfect life, the substitutionary death, let it not just be this kind of abstract kind of mythical thing that we talk about and think about, like let it actually 
Fill us with the knowledge of God, Holy Spirit. Not head knowledge, not information, intimacy, knowing. Let us know you as merciful. Let us experience you as as merciful. Paul prays that we would we would know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. How do you know something that surpasses knowledge? You experience it. Let us experience more of your love. Lord God, as we gather on Sundays and as we, as we, as we turn the corner in this, this season of what you're doing in and through us, I pray that you'd mark us, make us a people consecrated for worship. For, for proclaiming the excellencies of he who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your mercy. Let when we look at each other, we're like, oh man, that person is marked by God's mercy. Because we know each other. We know the ways that you've broken in, the ways that you've intervened. A people for your possession. We belong to you, Jesus. You're the king. Oh, Jesus, you're the king. And you're a king of mercies. Father of mercy. Fill us with the fullness of God, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming up here so people can see you. I really appreciate it. Uh, we got a couple minutes. All right. <clears throat> it's beautiful to watch the ways that God is meeting with us. Hear me, that's not limited to the church gathering on Sunday morning. The church can be together. The collective can be together, ministering, blessing God all the time. This week, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to meet him at the mercy seat. Like Eric talked about being pre-mercy, being past mercy, just such a strong word, bro. Let us not be people who operate in any of those spaces. Let us live in that radical middle, right? That, 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 that beautiful space of enjoying his mercy. Because I promise you, the alternative, there's no lasting joy. There's actually not real satisfaction in those spaces. The temptation that we each face is gonna be that we find satisfaction pre-mercy. I'm just not that bad or past mercy. But all the while, God wants to meet us in the mercy seat where we we can become face to face with our true worth. And God himself says, you and I were worth opening his veins for. The perfect one, the Lamb of God. So this week, what might it look like for you to meet him at the mercy seat as an individual? And what might it look like you to meet him at the mercy seat collectively? to enjoy him together. You want to know something about the grace of God? It's contagious. That means the ways that you experience him intervening in your life and power and in love and in his might and his glory and his goodness, his grace. The way that you experience that, whenever that's shared, it's contagious. It's powerful. That's my charge to you this week, church. Love you very much. Know that you're loved. Enjoy him, okay? Have a wonderful Sunday. If you would, uh, right at noon, if you could go pick up your kids, that'd be great. And if you'd, love to re- if you'd like to receive prayer or ministry of any kind, there's still some people available for that. You can kind of linger here. This is, about, this is a soft close, but noon, get your kids. Continue to pray if you'd like to, but love you very much.